for the message uh, this morning. I ask that we bow in a short word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We pray that you will speak through your message today. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, give us the understanding for what you would have us here today. Lord, may you be glorified through this message. May we be uplifted and strengthened through this message. May you alone be glorified through your messenger. For you, Jesus, are the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. The message this morning is entitled, The Best Gift with Many Benefits. The Best Gift with Many Benefits. I recently was sitting one day in my living room. And I heard what I thought was a light tap on my front door. So I went and I opened the door, but there was no one there. I looked down and I saw on the doorstep a small wrapped little chocolate bar. Where did it come from? I looked at the new fallen snow on the porch and I saw not human footsteps, but the tracks of a squirrel. An unexpected gift. I did not eat it from an unexpected source, dropped there by mistake. 2,000 years ago, God provided another unexpected gift, salvation. Ephesians 2, eight, verses 8 and 9, it says that Salvation is a gift from God, not of works, least anyone should boast. Yes. Jesus, the gift from God, the Son of God, John 3, 16, it says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe, that whoever would believe in, if everyone would believe in him, they would have eternal life. Jesus was that unexpected gift. bringing salvation to an unexpected source, his son. Now I did nothing to receive the chocolate bar. And we do not do anything to receive the gift of salvation. This girl came and dropped the chocolate bar on my front door. That was beyond my control. We do not do anything to receive the gift of salvation. It's already been purchased through the death of Jesus on the cross, and is freely offered. Unlike the bar, which was not safe to eat or receive, the bar reminds me of a false gospel based on works, which is also not safe to receive. But the gift of salvation is safe to receive from God, which is freely given and was purchased through the death of Jesus on the cross. That gift of salvation has no side effects. And it's never taken back. Amen. Jesus said in John 6 and verse 39, I will lose none that the Father has given me. The chocolate bar was dropped by mistake. An accidental gift, but the gift of salvation was planned from the beginning of time. With prophets over a 2,000 year period in different locations telling about the coming of Jesus the Messiah. Jesus, whose death would be the means by which mankind would be freed from the penalty of sin. When Jesus died on the cross, there was a thief on each side of him. But one believed in Jesus before he died, and so it is never too late in life to come to a faith relationship with Jesus as Savior and thereby become a member of the family of God. That reference I mentioned was in Luke 23 verses 32 to 43 where Jesus died, two thieves, one on each side of him. And one recognized who Jesus really was. And Jesus said, today you shall see me in paradise. The thief had nails through both hands so that he could not work, and a nail through each foot, so that he could not run errands for the Lord. He could not lift a hand or a foot, 
toward his salvation. And yet Christ offered him the gift of God and he took it. Christ threw him a passport and took him into paradise. Anyone at any time can receive that passport to heaven and the stamp is faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Approved. Your passport to heaven. It wasn't too late for the thief of the cross before he died to receive that passport. In 1981, a Minnesota radio station reported a story about a stolen car in California. Police were staging an intense search for the vehicle and the driver, even to the point of placing announcements on local radio stations to contact the thief. On the front seat of the stolen car set a box of crackers that, unknown to the thief, were laced with poison. The car owner had intended to use the crackers as rat bait. Now the police and the owner of the car were more interested in apprehending the thief to save his life than to recover the car. So often when we run from God, we feel it is to escape his punishment. But what we actually are doing is eluding and running from his rescue. Amen? Amen. A natural gift is there to be received from the giver. But a gift is not there forever. It may go bad, like a food product. Or be reclaimed by the giver. <coughs> or taken by someone else. In the same way, the gift of salvation is not there forever. Death comes and ends the time of choice for the individual. There's no purgatory, no second chance. The gift has been withdrawn as it was not claimed by that person in this life. C.S. Lewis said, when the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade all right, but what is good of saying you are on his side then? When you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else comes crashing in. This time it will be God without disguise. Something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen, whether we realized it before or not. Now, today, this moment is our chance to choose the right side. C.S. Lewis. I think of Isaiah and the contest on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal where he called out to the people of Israel, choose whom you will serve. God is calling people today and would say the same things. Choose whom you would serve. There are immediate benefits beyond the gift of salvation. Did you realize that? There are benefits to coming into that faith relationship with Jesus Christ. And I've written down ten benefits from coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Number one, a new beginning. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says that we have become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Behold, the old has passed away. We have been given a new beginning in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? A new beginning, number one. Number two, a new family. We, through faith, Romans 8.15 can call out Abba, Father. Because through faith in Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. We are co-heirs and joint heirs, heirs with Christ in Romans 8, 17. We may live in this world and have natural brothers and sisters and parents, but we have been adopted by faith into a new family that's eternal. The families we here, have here now are temporary, but... Being part of the family of God is forever. Amen. Number three, we have a new home. 
You know, some of us are paying mortgages that are buildings that are falling apart. Jesus said he would to go and prepare a place for us. John 14 and verse 3. We're going to have a place in heaven where there's no mortgages, where there's no bills, where there's no problem with repairs. We have a new home that's promised to us. Number four, we have a new body promised. As we get older, we look forward to a new body because these old models are falling apart. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 to 57, it says, Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking forward to a new resurrection body that will never wear out, that will never break down, that will never be in pain, that will never run out of energy. Amen. Something to look forward to. Number five, we have a new hope. You ever get hopeless? You ever get feeling, oh, how can I go on? I have no hope. People have betrayed me. People have let me down. We lose hope. Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We have a new hope. God has never broken his promises. God will never break his promises. We can claim those promises in our personal life. Number six, we have a new security. At a time when people are getting many different security instruments and equipment in their homes and in their cars because they're afraid of things being stolen, we have that new security in God. Psalms 46 and verse 1, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. God is a security system that will not break down. God is a security system that is always operational. Jesus in Matthew 28 and verse 20 said, He would be with us always. We can be secure in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We can be secure in knowing that God is our refuge and strength and never present help in time of trouble. Number seven, we have a new direction. Sometimes we spin like a car on ice, and the wheels just keep going round and round and round, and we've got no direction and no momentum. We have a lot of effort, and then we go nowhere. We have new direction as we trust fully in God. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, trust in in God with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Amen. We can have that new direction as we trust fully in God and as we are led by the Holy Spirit, the counselor and the comforter that Jesus said he would send to us once he was gone from this world. John 14 and verse 16. We have that new direction. That will not steer us wrong because God can see the whole picture in our life. And he can provide us the best direction and the guidance that we need in making the important decisions in our life. Number eight, new wisdom. James 1 and verse 5, it says, If we lack wisdom, we can pray and receive wisdom beyond our human understanding. So a lot of times we will face difficulties and we won't know what decisions to make we can have that wisdom from God number nine new provision God will provide for all of our needs in Christ Jesus Philippians 4 and verse 19 
all means material, <laughs> spiritual. Many times we are at a point when we're deeply in need. We don't know how we're going to come up with the means, either the strength or the financial means to meet a certain problem that we're facing. And I have seen many times where God has provided. I'm not saying that we pull God's strings. I'm not saying that we come to God and say, I want a BMW. I don't want to wait for my mansion in heaven. I want a mansion now. I'm not saying that we focus on material things. Because we're not told to do that. This is we're to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Not the treasures on earth which can be destroyed by moths or stolen by thieves. Yeah. We're to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, but yet even as we live on this earth, God will meet our needs, spiritual and material, as we focus on Him. Captain Levy, who was a believer from Philadelphia, was once asked how he could give so much to the Lord's work and still possess great wealth. The captain replied, Oh, as I shovel it out, he shovels it in. And the Lord has a bigger shovel. God, the God of a, thou a thousand cattle on a thousand hills, God can meet our needs. Number ten, new power. New power. I'm not talking about electricity. That power can go out during storms. Philippians 4.13 It says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That's power. Beyond our human power and beyond our human strength. We will receive the dunamis power also from the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.8 where it says that you shall receive power and be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the, of the world. That is power beyond our human power. That's spiritual power. Amen. There are times in the winter, like days like this with extreme cold, sometimes batteries don't work because they run out of power. <laughs> we can get our spiritual batteries recharged Amen. through the Holy Spirit. We also have the power of the living Word of God, which is sharper than a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4, 12, the Word of God is different from any other book you will ever read. Because the Word of God is living. And it's powerful. We do not have to live in defeat. Many people live in, de in defeat. And there's three areas they're defeated in. Number one, they're defeated in themselves. In Romans 6.23, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 3.23. In Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, His Son. We have victories over our sinful desires and temptations to faith in Jesus Christ that we would not have on our own. Why do people keep making resolutions every New Year's? Because often they don't follow through on the resolutions because they don't have the strength of will. Paul said in Romans 7, the things he wanted to do, he didn't do. And the things he didn't want to do, he did because of the power of sin within him. But further on, in Romans 8, he said the victory came not through his own willpower or through his efforts, but through his faith in Jesus Christ. So we can have victory over those areas of our life that are defeating us. And bringing frustration. Oh, I did it again. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I did it again. Yeah. The eye. The eye. Because the focus is on the eye instead of Christ. So we can have victory in areas of our own personal life where we face defeat. And number two. We face people who have already surrendered to sin. And they react to those who are followers of Jesus Christ. And they come against 
those who are followers of Jesus Christ. Because your life can be a testimony to what God has done in your life, but also in your transformed life, there will be people who will not like what they see in you. Because they will say, how can you be like that? And I want to be like that, but I cannot be like that, so I don't like you for being what I cannot be. Amen. And they will come against you. Drag you down. <clears throat> those in the world do not like those who are followers of Jesus Christ because we are not of this world. We're strangers, we're aliens, we're passing through. Jesus said, those who have hated me will hate those who follow me. However, in John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Jesus, in Matthew 28, the passage of the Great Commission, 18, 19, and 20, he said, all power in heaven and earth had been given to him. We have been called as ambassadors for, for Christ, have that power and authority backing us up. As we trust in Jesus Christ, we can be overcomers, Amen. not be overcome. Yes. Because Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Yes. As we trust in him, we can overcome any opposition that comes against us. Yes. Or we can be enabled to defeat our spiritual enemies. You are at war. Not at war just with yourself. Not at war with those in the world who have surrendered to sin and self-centered ambitions. You have a spiritual enemy. Now for those, there's, there's a word called woke, W-O-K-E. For those psychiatrists and psychologists who are woke today, who are culturally attuned today, Some will say, well, in the New Testament, when it refers to spiritual entities, when it refers to demons, those aren't really demons because they're just psychosis. They're just psychological problems, and we have advanced today. And they didn't know about the different types of psychology and psychiatry practices and theories that we have today. So we know better today. So those examples in the New Testament of spiritual entities called demons don't really exist. It's just a figment of the imagination. Well, I tell you, that as followers of Jesus Christ, you are involved in warfare. You're at war, and the entities of darkness, these fallen angels, are real. In Ephesians 6, verse 12, it says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. It mentions in that same passage in Ephesians 6 that we would have fiery darts thrown at us not by people but spiritual darts however in 1 John 4, 4 it says greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world we have the power Amen. both to defeat our own temptations and sin both to be overcomers when we're under persecution from those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. And also, when we are under direct spiritual attack, we can be victorious Amen. in Jesus Christ. Amen. We're at war. And yet, many Christians act as if they're at a tea party. It's like someone having a picnic out under a tree and sipping tea and eating little sandwiches while they hear in the distance the bombs dropping <laughs> and machine gun fire. And actually, during the Civil War, there were people from Washington who went with their picnic lunches to see a battle between the, the Union troops and the troops from the South. And they went with their picnic baskets because they thought the Union troops would easily overcome those from the South. And they went there to watch the battle with their picnic baskets. And then they later had to run when things didn't go the way they anticipated. We're not living in a battle where we take a picnic lunch. We're living in a real spiritual battle. We're living in a threefold battle. God has given us victory 
over those sinful desires we face. God has given us victory when we face persecution. God has given us victory when we face the spiritual attack, the spiritual warfare. That all of us who proclaim and accept that Jesus as Lord and Savior are involved in right now. Battle never ends. But we're victorious as we fight the battle in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now it says in the Bible that we, that we usually live three score and ten. And that's seventy years. Someone has calculated how a typical lifespan of 70 years is spent. Do you know that you will spend 23 years sleeping? <coughs> That's 32.9%. You will spend about 16 years working. You will spend 8 years watching TV. You will spend 6 years eating. You will spend 6 years traveling. You will spend 4.5 years in leisure. You will spend four years ill. You will spend two years dressing. But in serving God, you will only spend 0.5 years, which is 0.7%. A total of 70 years. So little time for God. So little time for God. We have received an eternal gift with many amazing benefits the gift of salvation. So what are we doing in appreciation to God in serving Him? Is He served still on the end of the end of our of our checklist? And usually for many people, God is at the end of their list until they're in trouble, and then He comes to the first point on their list. And then after the period of trouble ends, God gets put back down the list until something else happens. Paul says to redeem our time, to use it wisely. Ephesians 5, 15 to 16, and Colossians 4, 5. Not in trivial activities, but doing good. Titus 3, 8. For if we do not do what we know is good, like helping those in need, we have the means to assist. Then it says in James 4, 17, that that is sin. You know, a lot of people have a little checklist, and they, they say, oh, yep, check, I'm doing that, I'm not doing this, check, I'm not doing this, check, I'm not doing this, check, I'm not doing this. They got all the checklists of what they're not doing that God has forbidden, but then God lays in their heart to help a neighbor. Oh, nope, yep, can't help that neighbor. I, I remember what they said uh, last year on January 5th at, at uh, 3 in the afternoon, and, and they really ticked me off, so no, I can't go help that neighbor. Sometimes God gives us the means to help someone. Yeah. To do good. Yeah. I say, oh, no, no, it's not on my checklist. Doesn't, 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 oh, it does. It, it's sort of like rated right one of the last checklists. When we know what is good to do and we don't do it, it is sin to us. You know, the other sins are, are sins of commission. This is a sin of omission. We omit to do it. But it's just as important. God loved us enough to send His Son Jesus to die for us. Free gift. Jesus could have had a legion of angels take Him out of the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't have to go to the cross, but He went voluntarily in obedience to His Father, but also out of love for us. He died one of the most horrible deaths ever devised, crucifixion on the cross. He went there for you. He went there for me. We had that opportunity, and men and women, boys and girls today still have that opportunity to receive the gift. When you give a gift, you don't put your gift in front of a person up to their face and say, take it! You give a gift in love. Here's a gift. But the person has a choice whether to receive the gift or not. Now, I had no choice with, with the squirrel, because he just dropped the gift of the, of the chocolate bar. But the gift of salvation has been planned from all time, from the beginning of time. And it's a gift that God out of love provided for each person. But that gift is something that has to be received willingly by each individual. God doesn't force the gift. He said, here it is. 
Jesus said, come to me all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a promise. So often people are so burdened down. They say, well, how can I get rid of this burden? And people explain it's through faith in Jesus Christ and asking forgiveness and coming to accept Him as Lord and Savior. And they say, well, that's too easy. Where are the strings? And they make it so complex. Instead of realizing that God made it so simple. We need to recognize our need of Him as Lord and Savior. Come to Him in faith. Ask forgiveness of our sins. And be received into the family of God. But as I've mentioned, there are many benefits that we have received. As we have come to faith in Christ. Eternal benefits. Promises that God will never break. We are never alone. And God has given us the resources to be victorious. More than conquerors in Christ Jesus. So time is precious. Life is short. And you come to personal faith in Jesus Christ. Because when you die, there's no second chance. It's settled. Revelation 22, 12, one day the book of life will be opened and a search will be made for different names. Those whose name is not in the book of life will be separated from God forever. It mentions like a fire. Where is your name today? Is it in the book of life? Or is it not? Because one day that search will be made. <laughs> We thank God for the gift of salvation. We thank God for all these benefits <coughs> that God out of love has given to us in following Him. May we not take those benefits for granted. May we not take God for granted. He has called us through His Son, Jesus, to Himself. And He has given us a commission to go to those who yet need to hear Him. And to share that good news about that great gift. It says, it's like one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. We who have experienced faith in Jesus Christ should be like one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. We should be so excited and say, hey, look what Jesus has done in my life. And I want to share what he can do in your life. Amen? Amen. But often we keep it to ourselves. Instead of sharing that free gift. We have been commissioned by God to be the ones to share. Not even the angels have that responsibility to share. We have been called to share. We can share not only how they can come to faith in Christ, but all the benefits. It's like taking on an insurance plan. Well, here's how much it costs, and here's all the benefits. And then you make a decision cost Jesus his life in order for us to come into the family of God you know the Lord's prayer begins with our father Jesus doesn't say my father he says our father by faith we can call out to God the father and the father isn't that amazing isn't that precious that we can call out in faith and the father we may not have had a good natural father earthly father. But now we, through faith, have our heavenly father who loves us, cares for us, and is concerned for us. Life is short. So what are you doing for God? What are you doing for God? One day we should be called to give an account for how we have served God in this life. Don't earn our way to heaven through good works. Because it says salvation is a gift, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But once we have come to faith in Christ, there's an expectation that we will serve God with humility. One day we shall give an account as to how faithful we have been in serving Him. 1 Corinthians 3. One day our work will be judged as if by fire. And after the fire, whether it be like wood, hay, or stubble, ashes, or whether it be like precious jewels. 
This is symbolic. It said one day our life will be revealed as to what we have done in faithfully serving Jesus Christ. The Bema Sheet Judgment, the Judgment Seat of Christ. We thank God for the gift of salvation. We thank God for the benefits that come through being in a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. May we be faithful in serving Jesus. Jesus said we are to not deny ourselves and follow Him. We're to put Him first. We no longer own our life. He died to provide us new life. We have no rights anymore because what we have received in salvation has already been purchased. But there's a responsibility in following Jesus. May we be faithful in following Him. I never preach a message twice. This message will never be preached again. Maybe for you who are here, either physically, in person, or those who are here online, either now or later, this may be a message that God has given for you. The Holy Spirit may be speaking to your heart about an area of your life that is not right. And you can get it right today. Maybe you are not right with God at all. You've grown up in a church like I did for many years, became a member of a church, but was not a member of God's family. I had religion, but no relationship with Jesus. You may be in that position. Today, you can go beyond religion into that personal faith relationship with Jesus Christ. Or you may have that faith relationship and you've just been coasting to heaven. Well, I'm saved now, so I don't have to do anything more. I know the end of my journey. Well, there, there is more. <laughs> This is just the beginning when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. So you've just been coasting in cruise control but having been serving God, having been really serious about your faith. And this morning you can be serious and say, Lord, I've been, I've been just cruising along, not taking things seriously, not really acknowledging the benefits that come in salvation. Not really realizing that there's an expectation of me by God to serve Him in humility. That people might see the living Christ in what I say and what I do. God spoke into your heart this morning. If He has, the Holy Spirit is speaking to something that you need to deal with. Then deal with it now, not for me, but in obedience to what God, what the Holy Spirit is calling you to do. God spoke into your heart this morning. I would encourage you to come for prayer, and we will pray for you. Or if you are watching this live, or you're watching this later on, then you as well can come to faith in Christ, or renew your commitment to Jesus Christ in service to Him. God spoke into your heart. I encourage you to come, and I'll pray for you right now. Lord, I thank you for those who have come. Lord, we thank you how much you love us. That divine love, that agape love, that goes beyond our comprehension, our physical comprehension of love. Lord, we thank you. And we know from Scripture that nothing, nothing in Romans 8 will ever separate us from the love of Christ and love of God in Christ Jesus. Not even death. We thank you for all of these benefits that have come to us. Lord, we ask you to forgive us at times when we fall away and we become absorbed by the things of the world to the point where we're no longer serving you. Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Pray that even today we may recommit our life to you in service to you. And if anyone who is hearing this has not come to personal faith in you, I pray that they will call out and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, separated by my selfish desires. And I recognize, God, that out of love you sent your son Jesus to die for me on the cross in my place. And having lived a perfect life, and 
a perfect sacrifice was required. And I recognize that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. And I come to you, dear Lord Jesus, and I ask forgiveness for my sins, and I open up my heart and I invite you to come in as my Savior and Lord. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you are not a dead God, but a living Savior. Now we can come to you at any time in prayer. We thank you that we will never, ever be alone again. Amen. Now we're passing through this world. It's not our permanent home. And you've given us the resources to be victorious no matter what we face in this life. Amen. For we do not face it ever alone again. Amen. So be with each one who has come forward. Be with each one who is viewing this. May each one be strengthened and encouraged and empowered by the Spirit of God to be the people of God. Amen. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.